Hi, everyone. Welcome. It seems like there's a UK theme today. Marcus is indeed also from the UK. Well, uh, although our first speaker was not from there, I guess uh, they're there now. Uh, Marcus was edu actually actually educated in the uh, University of Liverpool for his PhD. Um, I met him when he was uh, in Japan working on uh, structure determination by uh, using X-ray free electron lasers. And uh, he continued his work in uh, structural analysis of uh, materials and then uh, biological samples and so on um, at UCLA for a short time in physics and then decided to join my group and pursue um, atomic structures of macromolecules. Um, lately, he's taken an interest in the polypeptides that are encoded by small open reading frames, trying to understand what uh, structures they might hold and what those structures might mean. And I think that's what he's going to tell us about today. So um, I'll let him take it away. Um, yeah. Let me just get my presentation slide. Oops. Okay. Everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking to you uh, about some work that I started actually towards the tail end of 2019, uh, which is the structural interrogation of small open reading frame encoded proteins or SEPs. Uh, so these are proteins that are in eukaryotes less than 100 amino acids and uh, in prokaryotes less than 50 amino acids. Um, so to kind of start off talking, uh, we'll talk about a little bit about mini or micro proteins uh, as they're typically referred to in the literature. So as I said, these are small proteins, they're very short polypeptide chains. You think of the average functional protein as maybe 200 to 400 amino acids. Uh, these are only a fraction of the size. Um, they're typically either expressed small or cleaved from larger proteins. So you can think of something like insulin, which starts as pro-insulin, is then cleaved and the functional form is a small protein. Uh, whereas others, such as myoregulin in muscles, um, is always small. Um, the reason I was interested in them is that despite the fact that they are so small and potentially you know, would appear to not be able to perform much function, uh, they have a huge impact on cells. So you, know, you can imagine the impact of insulin, which itself is only uh, you know, 30 plus amino acids. Uh, without insulin, we die. So. <laughs> Um, you know, these things can be pretty important and they typically function as uh, signaling molecules or through that interaction of larger proteins. And it's recently come to light that there are thousands and thousands of these within our cells and within the cells of other organisms. Uh, and they've mostly gone unannotated. We really don't know much about them. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know where they get located. Um, and so I wanted to see if uh, recent advances in structure prediction can actually help to close some of those gaps that are maybe left behind um, from a lot of the really great sequencing work that's been doing. Uh, and so another reason, you know, these are kind of capturing the attention, I think, of the media at the minute, um, because people are starting to engineer their own mini proteins. And they've got a lot of uh, good potential for therapeutics because, because they are so small, they can kind of get to places that larger protein therapeutics might not be able to. It's easier for them to pass through membranes and get inside of cells and escape degradation and, and these kind of things. Um, so the particular proteins I'm looking at are ones that are encoded by these small open reading frames. Um, and so I think over the past 10 years, um, because of the advances in, in sequencing, we've actually been able to identify uh, small open reading frames at a much higher rate than we had before, because we're not restricted by employing these kind of arbitrary cutoffs of the lengths uh, that a open reading frame needs to be. And uh, these things are turning up in all kinds of different places. So obviously, we have short isoforms from alternately spiced RNA of conventional um, open reading frames. We also see coding sequences themselves that are just short within uh, genome itself. And then there are also potential regions within uh, long non coding RNA or untranslated upstream RNA that we don't normally consider as, as coding. We think of it as either junk or structural uh, RNA, but they it seems now that they do actually potentially code for proteins. And whether or not these are proteins that have always existed, or they are things that are emerging spontaneously through mutation within genomes, it's, it's unclear. So they also potentially hint at you know, origins of protein structural or protein evolution within, within genomes. So I think they're quite a, an exciting area. Uh, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about one aspect of that. 
And so you can see they're incredibly prevalent. So uh, this graph is just mapping uh, the potential uh, number of small open reading frames within different eukaryotic optical organisms. And you can see that the potential number of open reading frames dwarfs uh, you know, the number of canonical open reading frames that we know about. And um, we also see that the you know, highly conserved across uh, the tree of life, uh, here are examples in bacteria where you see uh, kind of recurrent sequences that are seen you know, in very uh, diverse bacterial species of the same proteins coming up again. So they're also, as well as potential emergence of new function, they're also highly evolutionary conserved. So they seem to be playing a pretty key role in the cell, whether that's as uh, uh, functioning in themselves or whether they're you know, fine tuning metabolism and, and regulation. Um, so how do we detect these? Um, so obviously advances in metagenomics uh, allow us to look for open reading frames that are recurrent in either um, you know, multiple individuals of the same species or across closely related species so that we can build our confidence that this open reading frame is a true open reading frame and it's not just a spurious open reading frame that we're finding within the, within the genome. Uh, ribosome profiling allows us to pull out sequences that are being actively translated and so here we can then map those back to our reading frame within within the genome of the system that we're analyzing and determine, you know, is this a small open reading frame that's actually being translated within the cell? Uh, finally, mass spectrometry uh, has really advanced quite a lot to in its isolation of smaller and smaller peptides. And so then we can build, uh, you know, profiles of these small proteins from large proteomic studies. Um, so what kind of things do they do? Uh, a large chunk of them that have been characterized so far seem to play roles in translation, um, metabolism, um, and frequently nucleotide binding. However, we see them um, turning up in a lot of other things, such as secretion, signaling, uh, defense, uh, prokaryotes, particularly defense against phages. Um, and so we're kind of reading about this kind of got me really interested. And where, where I came in is you know, the question I wanted to ask was how many of these sequences, so there, there are thousands and thousands of sequences that are getting churned out from all of these studies, but how many of these correspond to what I would consider ordered or folded proteins? You know, when you have so few amino acids, it, it would seem that there are only a few ways in which the protein itself could fold up. Uh, and so I started mining a lot of these uh, databases for proteins that were smaller than 50 amino acids, uh, prokaryotes or 100 in eukaryotes. And then, uh, you know, searched against, you know, known databases of genes to see if there's any potential homology that might have a, a clue. And also if there's a high sequence identity to a, a known protein structure, I was a little less interested because, uh, you know, then the problem's already solved. Um, for those that weren't, we then assess the secondary structure and disorder of these proteins. So a lot of these small open reading frames do encode for proteins that appear to be highly intrinsically disordered. And that probably does play a role in their function and maybe they become ordered upon finding their binding partner. Um, but that problem is to me a little intractable. There are kind of too many unknown variables. So I, I wanted to, at least as a starting point, focus on the more tractable problem of proteins that seem to be highly ordered. Um, from that, uh, I would then use some of the modern tools and structure prediction to predict uh, the structure of this small protein and then look for structural homology that might provide a clue as to what the protein is doing. Uh, and the final step uh, that I'll talk a little bit about at the end is really attempt to express and purify and source structures of what I've deemed the most interesting target because we want to go back and experimentally validate um, from the predictions. Uh, so the, the first test set uh, actually came from this um, set of uh, 4,400 genes from uh, Amy Bart's lab at Stanford that they published in 2019. So I think they, they isolated and classified into about 4,000 families, but it wound up being about four, 440,000 candidate sequences. Uh, and they've done some rudimentary annotation. So I passed that for um, proteins that were secreted or antimicrobial, um, because I thought you know, they're potentially performing an inter interesting function. If they're secreted, they're likely to have some stable ordered fold. Uh, and I, I excluded anything that was transmembrane just because I knew that would prove challenging uh, later down the line when I'm actually trying to purify these things. Uh, so I wasn't so interested in the transmembrane initially, which did actually cut out a large chunk of, of the sequences. 
Uh, then these were predict the secondary structure and um, disorder was predicted by Cypride and that left me with a final set of um, a couple of hundred of highly, potentially highly ordered um, SCPs that have uh, a chance of forming some kind of three-dimensional tertiary structure. Uh, and so to predict the structure of these things, uh, I chose to use Rosetta. Uh, obviously it's not feasible to express purify and crystallize all of these. So uh, I wanted to use the prediction then as a, a second step to one, get a function and two, figure out if any of these are related. If they're related, we can classify them into families and then you know, we can choose representative targets from each family to then validate the, the predictions. Um, and so uh, the reason I thought this is possible because structure prediction is difficult, um, especially ab initio structure prediction where you're going really from an unfolded chain to a, to a tertiary fold, uh, is because these things are small. So <laughs> there, are, there are fewer degrees of freedom. There should be less computational demand to actually fold up the proteins. Um, added benefit for me as a structural biologist is that if the predicted structures are correct or close to correct, then I can use these as a starting point um, for solving structures uh, by crystallography or electron microscopy. So what I was really taking advantage of is um, something that's come up maybe in the past five years in protein structure prediction, and that's this idea of using uh, contact maps derived from multiple sequence alignments uh, to drive or constrain uh, the folding, and in particular using convolution, convolutional neural networks to predict uh, these contact maps from multiple alignments. So the, the basic idea is that if you have uh, a very deep multiple sequence alignment, what you'll see is there are variations in amino acids at particular positions in that sequence, and you can try and correlate the variations in amino acids at two different positions. If they're strongly correlated, it's likely that they're close in three-dimensional space. Um, and so that, that had been used for about 10, 15 years uh, as a means of determining which residues might be in contact. But really in the past five years, what we've been able to do is take uh, you know, our databases of known structure and use that to then train neural networks to predict, okay, if these two residues are close together, how close together are they likely to be? How confident are you in that? And so then rather than just uh, we should constrain these two residues, really what you get is we should constrain these two residues to within this distance with this particular confidence, with this particular tolerance. And so we get these kind of 2D potentials of uh, 2D potential representations of three-dimensional structure. And so these can be fed into folding algorithms as a way to further constrain the problem. And so this was actually used to great effect in about 2018 um, by DeepMind. And so this is just pulled from their paper where they had a deep, new, uh, deep convolutional neural network that had a 64, um, uh, the, term is, the term is escaping me at the minute. Um, my point is that they use it then to predict, uh, so it's a convolutional neural network that's traditionally used for predicting features in images and the features that they tried to predict were these two dimensional contact maps. And then they used these to constrain uh, gradient percent optimization of the fold where you're taking your uh, 3D structure, moving the amino acids in some particular way, and then checking back, does this match the uh, 2D representation of that fold? Uh, and so this worked really well. They uh, dramatically improved the quality of structural prediction overall, and people have built off this. Uh, the most recent work uh, is phenomenal. It's even better, and this actually uses attention-based um, deep learning. So it's a completely new model that I'm not going to talk about because they actually haven't released any of the information on that. <laughs> so we don't quite know what they've done. We just know that it worked really well. Uh, and so the particular um, variant I used is something developed by the Baker Lab, which is this transform restrained Rosetta. So it uses a, a similar idea, except now, instead of just predicting the distance between the two amino acids, so the C beta carbon of the amino acids, you're also trying to predict predict uh, angles that then represent how these two amino acids might be oriented in space as well as just how close they are. So now you have four layers of constraints rather than just one. Uh, and so this turns out to be really powerful. And actually the constraints themselves seem to drive the folding um, much more than any physical based force fields that are also applied to the structure prediction. Uh, and this means that it can be very quick. Uh, the caveat is that um, 
it can be very biased by those constraints. So any potential error in uh, these 2D potentials propagates through the structure. And the structures tend to be um, semi-deterministic. So no matter how many times you run the algorithm, you're more than likely to get the same output. And so because of that, I also uh, developed a pipeline using more conventional based methods. So here we use predictions of secondary structure to generate fragments from known structures that are three to nine amino acids long. Uh, the hypothesis here being the local sequence determines local structure. So we can use these fragments as an initialization of the fold of the backbone and then combined with um, differential sets of um, weight, so weight functions or score functions, we can slowly build up a three-dimensional fold and then finally refine this on the all atom level and check that um, our sequence is then converging. So all of our structures that have a low score are converging onto the same fold as a check for convergence of the algorithm. So the first thing I did was to cross-validate this, obviously. Um, I, so I pulled out a set of 30, a test set of about 36 proteins from the PDB of a range of different secondary structures and size between about 20 to 60 residues and uh, saw, you know, could I fold these successfully using the, the algorithms that I'd set out to. So for the most part, it worked. There are some cases where it did seem to have trouble. And this more tended to be due to, uh, these were structures typically derived by MMR, where you had some flexibility towards the termini of the protein. Uh, but the main core of the proteins always seemed to be fairly well predicted. And so, so these are just some examples of actual structures that I pulled out uh, from the many SE sequences. So you can see the kind of convergence I've seen with the different types of folds. Um, interestingly, in some cases, I did see an alternate fold emerge, whether or not this is the, the true fold of the protein or an off pathway state uh, is something I'm, I'm trying to explore at the minute. Uh, so a comparison of the two methods is the ab initio works well most of the time. Um, and what I was kind of hinting at here is that you get a very kind of solid deterministic answer from the um, mach machine learning based methods. Uh, it does seem to do better at predicting more extended faults. So if you focus on this one here, you'll see uh, the deep learning predicts a single helix, whereas uh, my ab initio pipeline predicts a, a more compact fold. I think the reason behind this is that the ab initio does rely on using the radius of gyration of the molecule as one method for determining how well folded it is. So it tends to enforce a more compact fold. Uh, whereas because you're just relying on the evolutionary constraints here, uh, that's not necessarily a problem with the deep learning based methods. So the final check is now that I have a predicted fold, is that fold stable? So here I'm then using MD and the physics based potentials to see if I place uh, this protein in more or less physiological predictions uh, and allow it to oscillate it based on um, based on these functions, uh, will it spontaneously unfold or will it maintain the fold that it has? So the hypothesis here being that if it does completely unfold in about 50 to 100 nanoseconds, it's probably a poorly predicted fold. Uh, and so in most of the cases, the ones I pulled out, uh, that seems to be the case. So you're seeing uh, the trajectories over about 50 nanoseconds here. And the graphs are indicating the radius of gyration and the RMSD to the starting molecule. And you can see that the variations are pretty low. Slight variations at the termini, as, as would be expected, but the overall topology remains the same. So now that I've predicted, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, 90 to 100 or so structures, can we then start to classify these? So some of the classification actually comes from sequence homology, uh, but in a lot of cases, these classifications are coming from structural homology. And so you can see that there's a, a wide range of functions that are being performed or potentially being performed by, by these uh, SEPs, uh, though uh, huge chunks still remained unknown. So I couldn't find any sequence or structural homology to any known proteins uh, for a large chunk. Uh, of these, uh, 11 had sequences that were completely unique. So there were no sequences in, in any databases that I can find corresponding to those small proteins. Uh, the predictions uh, mostly suggested they were single helices, um, 
Whether or not I can trust that, I don't know, because there's nothing, uh, you know, there's no multiple sequence alignment to actually learn from. So it's unclear how, how good those predictions are. Uh, but in some cases, I did find some that had a very strong tertiary fold that seems to be novel. Um, so uh, one of the things that came out uh, quite a few times is there were many of these small proteins that seemed to be involved in substrate binding. So some that could bind to ubiquitin, uh, polysaccharides of the bacterial cell wall, uh, some involved in beta-lactam binding, so binding to antibiotics, uh, NADP binding, so involved in uh, metabolism, and uh, a lot, and you know, these all have a conserved fold, as one would expect, and then also several that bind to nucleotides, so both RNA and DNA, and here there's more variety in fold because there are several different ways in which you could bind to RNA or DNA, the different sequences that you might recognize. Um, Another interesting fold that came out is there are some that seem to be related to transcription regulators. So this 2W1T uh, is the solved X-ray structure of SPOVT, which is a transcription regulator that that's involved in spore formation. So what was interesting to me is that these proteins seem to uh, form a fold that is reminiscent of the dimer interface between these uh, two halves of this uh, functional dimeric unit. So this protein functions in the obligate dimer so if this you know, protein could potentially bind into that dimer pocket, it could disrupt the activity of this transcription factor. And so it potentially playing a negative regulatory role within the bacterial cells. And the final uh, is this unknown fault family. So I, I really don't know what this is doing. Uh, there is a lot of homology between each of these uh, proteins, um, but there is no homology to any known sequence or structure. Uh, it does seem to be pretty highly conserved in bacteria but uh, I'm not sure what it's doing. I have managed to express this and um, my kind of preliminary investigations uh, seem to indicate that it binds to nitrates, um, whether that's just spontaneous or that's a, a real function uh, I'm yet to tease out. So I'm really working hard to try and solve the structure of this thing and see if uh, you know this fold is real and then what it might be able to do. And so I've applied a similar strategy to some data that I received from some collaborators who are working um, on proteomics of algae. Uh, and so in this case, these are derived from not metagenomics, but actually from uh, proteomic screens, so from mass spectrometry. And so here is actually, because these are solubly expressed proteins, I think that makes them a little uh, easier to study. And I was able to identify uh, what a lot more of them are doing based on their structures, although there are still some that are unknown. Um, but again, there's kind of seems to be a large range of process, cellular processes that these things are involved in. Uh, so the final steps, I'm currently working on high throughput expression of these. So I have about 90 plus targets that I'm trying to express and purify. Uh, so initially I, I did this in a high throughput manner because I want to, I don't have that much time, especially right now. So I want to make sure that I'm focusing on the, the most promising targets first. Um, and just a preliminary so you can see that here I'm using a Doppler assay with an anti-HIS antibody. So all of my proteins are HIS tagged. Uh, and we can see that, you know, as I'd kind of expect from the proteomic screen, most of these are actually expressed solubly, which to me makes sense because that's how they're isolated in the first place. Uh, for the bacterial ones, uh, I see a lot less expression. So whether this is because, um, you know, they're less stable or you know, maybe they weren't real in the first place because of the origin of the data, uh, is unclear yet, but I'm kind of moving forward with trying to characterize as many of these structurally as possible. Uh, in particular, our lab focuses on electron microscopy, so that's kind of my chosen method. Um, reason being that a lot, I think a lot of these small proteins are likely to form small crystals because small fluctuations in the protein itself could actually have propagate to ma major lattice defects, so that will uh, make them pretty difficult to work with. Uh, if I can isolate these in complex with some of their larger uh, molecular potential molecular partners. Hopefully I can use cryogen as well. Uh, we have access to microscopes here, so I think it also makes sense to try and pursue uh, this direction. So what have I found out so far is that uh, it does look like a significant, um, a small but significant fraction of these SFEs are forming some kind of compact 3D fold. And despite their low sequence homology to, to many known sequences, it does seem that there is a lot of structural conservation um, so for the transcription, potentially transcriptional regulator proteins that I showed, you know, the homology between each other is less than 20%, but the, the structural homology is really high. Um, and really, I think 
what I'm trying to show is that you know we can use these modern prediction methods, which are a lot faster and more accessible than they used to be, uh, to really dive deeper into the function uh, that we're pulling out from these genomic screens of the proteins that we pull out from these genomic screens. Uh, and it does look like I found some novel faults, hopefully, which was uh, one of my initial goals going into this. Um, so now I'm, I'm really uh, working hard to try and validate a lot of these structures and the proposed interactions experimentally, uh, and also um, pushing forward with developments in electron microscopy to try and uh, make it more high throughput, so a more robust method of solving these structures. Uh, and that's it, so thanks for your time. Uh, obviously, I've had a, uh, a lot of help from a, a lot of people, in particular, Duilio Casio and Mike Sawaya from UCLA for a lot of the, the structure-based stuff. Uh, Jose for allowing me to pursue what uh, at first seemed like a pretty crazy idea, but uh, has turned out, I think, some useful information. Uh, and also Sabia Merchants Lab for providing the data from the ALGA. And I'll happy to take any questions. Great, that was uh, really cool. Really great to see how far it's come. Are there any questions from anyone? I, maybe I, I, I have the uh, um, question sort of that, uh, so, you know, you distinguish, of course, between sequence homology and now structural homology, and two are not necessarily, uh, you know, one doesn't necessarily lead to the other, which yes. suggests that, does that suggest that there's sort of a convergent evolution? I mean, the different paths going to the same structure? I, I think so, yeah. I think that's... Um... Either, mm -hmm. well, I think there's there's two things to consider. One is that where is the sequence homology? Because it, it may be that the majority of the residues, you know, aren't playing a role in the, the function or aren't playing a role in driving that particular fold. And as such, there may be some degeneracy uh, around certain positions. So you could see, you could get to a position where you have uh, a lot of the residues have mutated away or changed to something different, but the core fold remains the same because the kind of linchpin residues are conserved. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's more likely that, you know, over time things have just diversified and the tolerable mutations have been maintained. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is that, so another way to maybe try to characterize these protein structures it's not in their in in the lowest energy you know form, but in the in the dynamics of that of 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 different secondary structure elements yeah that's that's true uh, and i think um that is something i want to tease out uh, i think that becomes much more uh, computationally difficult. Yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, if we believe that the, the predict tools for prediction that are used are representative of those folding pathways, uh, one thing I think would be really cool to do is to go back and then classify what kind of substructures are, um, you know, frequently emerging within those pathways. And are those potential alternate states that maybe aren't the lowest energy, but are stable mm -hmm. that could be appearing? Right. But well, when I think about you know the the, the variety of different folds or the, the dynamics of a of a of a structure like this, um, I you know I don't even know how one could visualize or represent that type of emergent property, if you will, you know. And so I'm inspired by the previous talk where we you know we were reminded of theory like Hopf bifurcation analysis that provides a way of actually characterizing and visualizing this fundamental property about a multi-molecular system. I wonder what, whether that's something that is, whether there's something analogous that you can do when you're talking about the dynamics of different domains that are linked by polypeptide. Um, and yeah, it's a crazy, crazy question. I'm just, you know. Uh, I, th I think I see what you're saying though, but I guess, one way to think of it is you could represent, you know, structures as existing on some kind of manifold. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you know, there are potential wells within that manifold where at some point or under some condition, a particular fold is more likely than another. But the protein itself can be under some kind of constant flux. Mm -hmm. and I think, you know, just the tools we have right now, unfortunately, can only probably 
uh, access that lowest energy state, or at least only visualize that lowest energy state initially. I think cryo-EM is going some way um, in you know, using multivariate analysis during the classification of the images mm -hmm. that come out of that to try and tease out molecular motions. Mm -hmm. uh, and something I'm interested in is really, you know, even within a in the solid state, within the crystalline state of a, of a protein crystal, I don't think there's a, a static uh, mm -hmm. snapshot of that one particular protein, except mm -hmm. in you know, the most ordered crystals. But is there, can we access, you know, some amount of flux from, from these crystals if we can start to look at domains within crystals that are, are smaller than have been conventionally looked at? Right. So it's well, an interesting problem. I think it's just uh experimentally hard to get at and without yeah. being able to do the experiments we can't necessarily back up the simulations <laughs> right it seems tempting to do cryo em studies in a variety of different conditions right not just in an optimal condition <laughs> yeah yeah i think so um, but <laughs> that that then comes back to the the challenge of time i think we only yeah, have yeah, so yeah, much yeah, access yeah. to these instruments <laughs> right very cool sorry any other questions